awareness and social reconstruction becomes expedient. They never told you how you offended them. I'm not on trial, so I can't go before you. Join the radio man, Edmond Dombino, on state affairs, the local and international politics, security, extensive economic analysis, interviews, and world power play. Nigerians must choose the part they want to follow. Follow the same looters and sponsors of values who control the political structures or encourage the formation of a new leadership team. Be a global citizen and join the radio revolution on State Affairs. State Affairs with Edmond Obino. Radio just got deeper. State Affairs with Edmond Obino is live. The program is State Affairs. Welcome to my word. I am Edmund Opilo. On this edition of the program, we will be looking at Africa's security challenges in the 21st century. And my guest is Professor Tunde Adeniro, a former Minister of Education a former ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany. Before I bring in the prof, let's look at insecurity from this standpoint. The Sahel is a volcano that has erupted in Africa. Look at it. From Mali to Burkina Faso, stretching to Chad and Niger, covering the northeast of Nigeria, multiple armed groups, national armies, as well as local militias engage in violent conflicts that drive poverty. When in 2012, Mali descended into a war, the governance architecture in Africa was again called to question. The conflicts are ethnic and religious in nature. It has to do with human rights. It has to do with justice. These issues are embedded in bitter politics, resulting in massive corruption and underdevelopment in the Sahel region. Sometimes, the quest for justice by the oppressed leads to bloody insurrections. The alliance of separatists and armed groups that took over northern Mali in 2012 exposed the weaknesses of African states in providing incentives for development. Though France intervened to stop the collapse of Mali, the conflict has spread to Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Nigeria, Sudan, and Eritrea in the Red Sea. These are countries of the Sahel a semi-arid region in the southern fringe of the Sahara Desert. It runs from northern Senegal on the Atlantic Ocean coast through Mauritania. The violence expands in the face of the creation of the G5, a single command to facilitate joint operations and improve intelligence sharing. Has the G5 not collapsed? Would France play minimal role in places like Mali and Burkina Faso? Using the Sahel as a case study of Africa's security challenges in the 21st century, other questions will arise. What are the roles of the superpower? in the security challenges in Africa. So it becomes interesting 
to find a book, a book dedicated to Africa's security challenges in the 21st century. Power, Principles and Praxis in Global Politics. Look at this book. Yes. Look at this book, written by Professor Tunde Adeniro, a professor of political science. If you read this book, you would find the challenges and the way forward in tackling the issues of security in Africa. Professor Tunde Adeniro, it's good to have you on State Affairs. It's a great, very great pleasure to be with you. You have written another classic for us. Thank you very much. What pushed you to dedicate your time to writing this book? I felt I owed it a duty to humanity and the world of scholarship to commit to writing some of the ideas contained in that book. Security is perhaps the most important issue confronting humanity today. Most things are tied to security. And when we get security right, we will get other things right. I usually, and I still believe very strongly, that we talk about education as the key to development, education as the key to better life and so forth. But without security, you cannot even have education. So security, when taken from the micro level to the macro level, we discover that it defines human existence altogether. And in the case of the African continent, we see that Everything revolves around security. We have not been able to develop to the level that we ought to because of insecurity. And where we have been able to make some progress, some little progress here and there, is because we have security in those areas. And security generally, you've mentioned the Sahel. Sahel is a message, it's a signal, it's something that tells us what will likely happen to Africa, in other words, that we might be consumed if care is not taken, because the Sahel has been plunged into insecurity, and the Sahel is plunging the areas of Africa into insecurity, greater insecurity than ever before, that could be imagined by uh, visionaries. When we look at this, we begin to ask ourselves, what brought us to this level? Simple policies of our government, policies of our leaders. People talk about leadership deficit here and there and so forth. The inability to be able to identify security and give it priority in policies. In this book, yes, you made reference to Africa's colonial past yeah. as also a problem, is it not? It is part of the problem, but not the whole. It's not that not the whole story. It is part of it, and the question we should be asking ourselves is that for how long should we continue to blame colonialism? Colonialism was a factor. It remains part of what is haunting us, quite all right. But then we need to factor that into the policies that we put in place. In other words, to appreciate the fact that where well, we were once colonized, and the impact are still with us, but. The policies that we dish out, you know, policies are the independent variables. The independent variables, uh, the dependent variables are the outcome, the political consequences, the social consequences, the cultural consequences, the economic consequences of those policies. And that is what has led us to what we are now lamenting. People are saying, oh, there's poverty, there's no food, and so forth. Food insecurity, for instance, which is part of the overall general insecurity. The Sahel, what is driving the Sahel? What has led the Sahel to where we have now? 
a number of factors tied to lack of security in terms of food, lack of security in terms of livelihood, lack of security in terms of even what will ensure that there is food production, what will ensure that there is harmony, understanding among the people. You can go back to the colonial background that you mentioned earlier on. In other words, that colonialism has gone so far to dividing us, to promoting those factors that divide us rather than encouraging those things that unite us. The diversities, why is it that we have not been able to manage the diversities? The diversities that really ought to be part of the sources of our strength in other words, to be able to complement one another in different areas. The diversities are sources of strength, and they should be able to enable us to tap, to complement one another in different areas. But we have allowed the colonial factor not only to divide, but to permanently continue to promote that division. We have in the Sahel, for example, the different ethnic groups nationalities, state nations, even before nation states were about to be created out of those by the nationalists. But then, the colonialists, the big powers that you also refer to, they are mindful of this. They know this. They have their own differences over there, but then they do whatever they can at any given time to make sure that they checkmate. They do not allow those factors and forces to overwhelm them. They control them. But in our case, we just we let them loose. As we speak, there is crisis in the Congo. There is crisis in Sudan. In fact, there is a war going on in Sudan. South Sudan is unstable. Ethiopia just came out of a recent civil war. In Mali, terrorists are holding more than half of the country's territory. Same in Burkina Faso. There is Al-Shabaab in Somalia. In Nigeria, Boko Haram is dominant around the Lake Chad Basin. And you can see, even from independence, there have been this consistent insecurity in Africa. Is it connected to the African personality? It won't be right to say that it is connected with the African personality. Uh, we inherited certain disadvantages quite all right because I give two examples. The way we were marked left and right. The way nationalities were broken and the way people that ordinarily do not have identical cultural backgrounds were forced to come together under some nations or some states and so forth. This came suddenly from the colonial fiat. If it had grown as a result of common understanding, working together the way some African communities, societies were doing in the past. Building empire, we had our own empires in the past. There were nation states in the past. But because of the force, the imperial force that created artificial boundaries, different people were wedded together. And in an attempt to now find ways of working together and so forth, the colonial used that as instrument to come, hey, you people, they know that that, can, that wedge, they continue to put it behind. That is one. Then the other one, of course, is religion. Religion was introduced as a way of making people have faith in the almighty God. But the way it was introduced was such that it has grown and germinated and became one of the forces and factors creating problem instead of serving as a rallying point for or even development, for understanding, for having common concern for humanity. It has turned out to be a negative thing. The 
Various countries that you mentioned earlier on, yes, it is easy to just conclude that look, we are having this in the Congo Republic, we are having this in all these other countries, Sudan, Somalia, and all that. It must be something wrong with Africa. What is wrong with Africa is that we have not been able to fully appreciate the dimensions of the problem that we have and also take necessary steps to address those problems. Addressing those problems will mean appreciation of what the problems really are and then taking the right steps. I do believe that we have in this continent leaders who are mindful of their responsibility, leaders who are mindful of what they owe the coming generations and the opportunity that they now have to address the problems facing us so that we will be able to solve them for now and prevent future occurrences. I will say two things in this regard. Now, what has been going on without the interference of outsiders? Take the Congo, for example. The mineral resources in that place are enough to make that particular country dominate the entire world. So endowed. You talk about Nigeria too. I do not know of any country in the world that is as endowed as Nigeria. Well, look at where we are today. In the case of the Congo Prof, you have the M23 rebels. Yes. You know, dominating some areas. And Rwanda is being accused of sponsoring the M23 rebels. You have the influence of Uganda within that axis. Yes. The point I'm trying to make is that even African countries are deeply involved in the crisis in the Congo. How do you explain that? That can be explained from two perspectives, at least. One is that there are some countries that believe these crisis areas should emerge and develop in their own image. They had their own experiences, and they believe that these countries too, that are going through one crisis or the other, could emerge in one way or the other. And they do not want to be shut off, to be shut out. They want to be part of those who will determine the future of these countries. That is where Uganda comes in, or you talk about Rwanda. What is going on in Rwanda today? With the experience of Rwanda, Rwanda, you know that Africa has a lot to learn in terms of living in harmony, living in unity. What could happen when you push ethnicity to the very, you know, uh, to the background, and you unite your people on the basis of common humanity? You do not talk much about Tutsis, Hutus, and all that and so forth. Rwanda is Rwanda. And they are being held together by a common cause, common goal of building, of developing their country. And looking at some other countries around, Rwanda, I believe, also thinks that, look, it is better to get a leadership that will be able to lead those countries, to unite them, and bring them up. But yeah, That's such a way. there is also the ethnic question being raised yes. about Rwanda's role in the Congo. Yes. Because you have some Tusis in the Congo too. Yeah. yeah. So the M23 are Tusi rebels. And they are making the point, they are protecting the Tusis so that what happened in Rwanda does not repeat itself in precisely, the Congo. Precisely, precisely. You get it right. You get it right. Because it is seen that, look, uh, there is usually the saying that external rejection leads to internal solidarity. When people who are part of a larger body are being given the impression that they are not wanted, they recoil to their shell. They now redefine themselves from the narrow perspective of you know, who they think they are and then operate from that and then seek alliances outside of the area, the space, where they don't seem to be wanted. And they now seek, they make recourse 
to those forces and factors that will enable them to survive. Because the survival instinct, not just in the African, in, in the human race, is very, very strong. And they will do whatever they can to make sure that they survive in order to be able to get to wherever they want to get to or become whatever they want to be. And the second perspective that I was trying to mention earlier on is, apart from these African leaders, African countries, trying to get these crisis areas to mold them, to get them to two particular lines favorable to their own perspective, you also see the external forces at work. If the mineral resources are not available to these uh, outside forces, would they be able to maintain their standard of living? Would they be able to use, I mean, amass more resources, wealth, and so forth, to be able to dominate the world or to control us? The money they get, all the things they take from Africa, are what we are borrowing back from them, putting us in perpetual debt. But they use the African. They use the African, yes. Remember Patrice Lumumba? Of course. Mobutu was used. Oh, yes. They took him out. To eliminate him. Because he was strong-willed. And he felt he needed to liberate Africa. And go in a particular direction. Which would be to the betterment of Africa. To the liberation of Africa. And more importantly, to make Africa trod a path that consistently strengthen the African vision, the, the type of development that uh, will make Africa respectable. Professor De Niro, I'm still on the Congo. That country in recent time has fought two devastating wars. In fact, the, it is called the Congo World War. How do we stop the big players in world politics? from controlling Congo. It is a war of resources. When they got tired of Mobutu, they kicked him out. They brought in Kabila. At some point, Kabila was assassinated. Mm. There is still no peace in the Congo. And you have mentioned the influence of external forces. How do we check them in Africa? We can check the external influences. We can do that. Not by appealing to them to please leave us alone but by taking appropriate actions. I did say earlier on that the policies that we pursue, the goals that drive us, these are the things that will enable those people that will tell them, look, the signal will be clear that indeed Africa has come of age and that we want to be left alone not by mere vocalizing it, not through any advocacy and all that, but by the actions that we take. Those actions, we checkmate them. In other words, we have to be able to secure ourselves. But there must be security, internal security. There must be stability. So long as we continue to make ourselves vulnerable, so long as we continue to have leaders who are not committed to national development, to African development and security, we will not be able to get out of the chains of these colonial, uh, former colonial powers and other superpowers. Prof, let's come to West Africa. Recently, there were military coups in Mali, in Niger, yeah. in Burkina Faso, Guinea. in Guinea. Mm. And one victim of these coups is France. It seems France has been kicked out of Mali, out of Niger, and Burkina Faso. Is that the right action you are calling for? I'm calling for much more than that. It is not enough just to kick out, uh, just to kick out a, a colonial master, which is the common, the common language used for that and so forth, those who have been popularizing Africa, those who have been holding Africa hostage and preventing us from developing, it must go beyond that to have consistency in terms of being able to galvanize people toward development, being able to unite the people. You do not kick out an external 
you know, power uh, intruder that had come to dominate, that had come to enslave, and then subject yourself to new internal uh, colonialism. In other words, you do not create an avenue whereby sub ethnic groups or some ethnic groups now assume the role that used to be played by those external powers. You have to create a common ground. You have to make people believe in common goals, in nationhood. You have to be able to mobilize support from ethnic loyalties to a national common goal. In other words, you build a nation out of the various sub-ethnic groups and ethnic nationalities that you have by making sure that there is fairness, there is justice, there is equity, and above all, there is a rallying goal agreed to. The values that we have in Africa are so ennobling that should be used as a common uh, factor to get all of us together, to move all of us together, no matter what part of the African continent. It's a common thing all over. We are looking at Africa's security challenges in the 21st century. And I'm discussing with Nigeria's former Minister of Education, Professor Tunde Adeniro. Professor Adeniro is a political philosopher. He has given us a new book, a book we should read, understand, and then use the ideas to build a new Africa. The book is entitled Africa's Security Challenges in the 21st Century, Power, Principles, and Praxis in Global Politics. Here is the book. Remember, Professor Deniro is a political scientist. He was, at a point, Nigeria's ambassador to Germany. So when it comes to international relations, international politics, Professor Deniro is there. I recommend this book to you. You can get this book on udarabooks.com. And you can contact us on our WhatsApp numbers to get this book. One of the numbers is 080-399-18449. So the numbers are on the screen. You can contact us on WhatsApp to get this quality work from an African scholar. Discussing Africa's security challenges in the 21st century. The book is a detailed examination of the sources and drivers of security concerns in Africa. And we are using contemporary issues to explain the ideas that Professor Deniro has put down in this book. Prof, we were talking about France in West Africa. The return of the military, how does that affect security challenges in Africa? The return of the military is compounding it. Compounding it in the sense that we will be moving forward and making progress when we consolidate democracy. And when the military strikes, it strikes in an environment that uh, could be diversionary occasionally. What we need to do is to always make efforts to prevent situations that lead to military takeover. In other words, to consolidate democracy, we have to continue to be democratic in what we do, to ensure that we mobilize people towards the determination of their own destinies. Uh, we do not assume the role 
of militaries. You see, the military is seen as dictatorial. Sometimes we have civilian authorities that are dictatorial. When you now have a situation in which certain things have happened in certain areas, look at what has happened in, we talk about Niger, Mali, and some others, and so on. Kicking out France, you see the reception that the people gave. And you see the consequences, what had happened since then. Because some people knew, the majority of the people, they knew that, look, certain things were not right. They needed a change. I believe that if certain things had been the way they should be in those countries, what happened would not have happened. Remember, France out. Yes. Russia in. Yes. That's what I've come to. Now they're out. The people felt that, look, they cannot be on their own. They still need that external support. What we need is not external control in Africa. We need external understanding. We need external respect and external collaboration and cooperation. We have all that it takes. Why has Russia moved in? Russia could not have moved in if the resources were not there because the cost-benefit analysis shows that they have a lot to benefit by coming in. And France is losing a lot, apart from image, material resources, what they were taking, the, 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 resources, the mineral resources they were taking away, and with pitons coming back to those countries, it's just not right. Are you saying good riddance to bad rubbish? To some extent, yes. I want them to go further to establish themselves, not to be replacing one colonial you know, power with another, but to be able to consolidate on their own and, of course, work out a program on the basis of ECOWAS recommendation and give power back to the people. As they suffered terrorism, as the military came in, ECOWAS imposed sanctions on these countries. In fact, Nigeria's president threatened to go to war in Niger. How would you assess President Tinubu's reaction to what happened in Niger? My reading of uh, President uh, Bola Tinubu's reaction uh, at that time was that he was worried that democracy was being assaulted and that uh, while we are trying to consolidate democracy all over uh, Africa, we should be having a recourse to a tendency that takes us way back from where we tend to be going. And uh, his immediate reaction at that time by, you said, threatening to go to war and so forth, I think uh, ECOWAS was being called upon at that time to say, hey, look at what is happening, be careful. Because this trend is not good. It's not good for democratic consolidation in Africa. And that unless something is done about this, uh, it could be spreading. And of course, the much spread of uh, coups in the past, uh, we know what it cost us in Africa, including Nigeria. So I think he was reacting on the basis of the need to ensure that uh, they were checkmated. Did he and overreact? Well, is uh, there is no gauge uh, to really uh, assess that whether he overreacted, but I think he was speaking on behalf of ECOWAS, not on behalf of Nigeria. As such Nigeria, Nigeria cut off power supply. Yes, with Nigeria position, Nigeria realized that well, uh, we must key into the ECOWAS position, particularly as the leader in, within the ECOWAS Commission. We cannot be. Uh, claiming to be the leader of ECOWAS without maybe showing example. I think that was what uh, President Bola Tinubu wanted to uh, show at that time. And then it turned out that, well, after making some pronouncements, uh, you know, as a Nigerian leader and as ECOWAS leader, so many things came on to, uh, to realize that, look, okay, maybe we should give more chance to alternative means of resolving this. In other words, that, look, when reduced to fundamentals, when the chips are down, these people 
what separates some of them from being Nigerians is the colonial uh, divide, that some of them are our own people, and that uh, when we take such actions, uh, we, we are also causing some pain you know, to our people. And the decision reached eventually, uh, recently, of course, lifting this and so forth, was a most welcome decision. And I think it's, it's in the right direction so that there can be some meeting of minds, some collaboration, some discussion that could lead to not just reestablishing old relationship, old uh, community, uh, a sense of community, belonging to the same community, but more than that, also using that to look into the future. How do we prevent this occurrence in future? How do we avoid a situation that leads to what this, the type of decision that was taken. And I believe the spillover effect of what uh, has been done now will be seen coming out positively before long. You know, some would say that Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso were forced out of ECOWAS because they announced they were leaving ECOWAS. And they have formed a coalition. A coalition to stand together. Do you think they will come back to ECOWAS? Their coming back to ECOWAS depends on a number of factors. If you feel welcome in the present circumstances, once they feel welcome, they will come back. In other words, there are certain conditions that will also have to prevail. But if certain steps are taken to further make them feel unwanted, then of course it will be difficult for them to reconsider their position. Uh, nothing is absolute in this case. You cannot say, you know, like the usual saying that interests are the things that are permanent. Uh, when you talk about adversaries, I won't call them enemies, you know, adversaries or, you know, those in opposing sides of a particular issue. They can always come together once the interest coalesce. It is important to continue to cultivate that tie, that friendship between African brother nations. It is better, it is in the interest of Africa as a whole. And through that, we'll be able to collectively tackle the problems facing us. Insecurity cannot be tackled without collaboration. Insecurity cannot be tackled without cooperation, without planning together at some level, because there are some areas that we cannot run away from, some issues that we cannot run away to, from. We mentioned earlier on this issue of food security. And unless and until we realize and appreciate that, that indeed this is one area, critical area, to prevent famine, to prevent starvation, to prevent deeper, we, we, us the Africans, getting deeper into poverty, that that aspect will have to be tackled as a way of tackling insecurity generally. I did say also that looking at that issue, we have to be thinking what indeed are we talking about when we are talking about security through food security? It has not just only to be available, it starts to be affordable, it has to be in good quality, and above all, it has to be sustainable, which means that the effort that we are making, the policies that we are dishing out have to be seen within that perspective, from that perspective, that what is it that will last? Not just approach it like uh, firefighting or uh, this thing. And to do this, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, in terms of food that we cannot produce in this Africa. Mm. What we cannot produce in this country, they, have, they can produce it in Mali, they can produce in some other country. In fact, I believe that there's nothing we cannot produce in this country because of our own vegetation and so on. But by collaborating with those other countries in the Sahel, we'll be able to assist them. But when we are not secure here, we have Boko Haram, we have all this insecurity, 
being bred from our side, fed into our system, penetrating our forest, and doing harm, not just to physical security, but to future security. Because when there's no food, people will be starving. When there's no food, people will not be able to go. I mean, when there's the, the forests are not safe, people will not be able to go there to cultivate and plan for the future. Prof, presently, yeah. Nigerians are looting warehouses. They are attacking trailers on the highway, ferrying foods to different parts of Nigeria. As we speak, the Middle Belt is in crisis. The Plateau, Benue, bandits are on rampage. If you go to Zanfara, bandits are capturing communities and mining mineral resources. The state seems incapable of tackling the insecurity. As things stand, what do you see in the future? The signals are worrisome, very worrisome. And I believe that it isn't that the state is incapable. The state needs the political will to really tackle the problem. If we don't tackle the problem, look at the two areas that you mentioned. People are now laying ambush for food being carried to one part of the country or the other. Starvation is coming in. Hunger is coming in. And when hunger comes in, that is the height of poverty. People will be ready to go to any length to make sure that they stay alive by feeding. And that must be prevented. It must be prevented by coming up with appropriate policies that will make this food, like I said, accessible and affordable and also sustainable, not just for to finish type of thing. Is the not palliative for a, a week or two or whatever. That will be sustainable. Now, the other area, you cannot secure those various communities from bandits, from terrorists, unless the security architecture is right. And for it to be right, it has to factor in the domestic. It has to be owned by the local people. The local people must be part of that security architecture. They must see it as their machinery for defending themselves. They must key into it. They mustn't see it as something put in place to serve or service the interests of some outside powers or some government outside of their own domain. But they must be seen to be owning it. In other words, they must be integral parts of that security architecture that will prevent banditry from spreading for even taking hold. Until and unless we do that, we are in trouble. You know, Prof, you have been a member of the political class over time. Insecurity on Dabuhari was alarming. He couldn't check it. Under Jonathan, it was also alarming. The point I'm making is that the spate of insecurity is growing as we go. Does the political class have the capacity for redemption? I believe the capacity is there. The question is, why is the capacity not being deployed to tackle the problem? And that is when and uh, where the issue of the political will comes in. If any government continues to calculate costs in terms of what it will be for their own political leverage and so forth, we are not going to go it anywhere. But we should have that political will to be able to determine what is good, what is in the larger interest of the nation, of the common man, of Nigerians generally. In other words, not what is in the interest of my own political future, career, of my own political party, we have to be able to take some decisive steps. Security requires a multidimensional approach. 
not a partisan issue and should be handled from a non-partisan angle. Mobilize all the necessary forces. Mobilize the people themselves to be able to defend their own future and their own security. And above all, come up with policies that could hurt or not that advantageous to your own political party preferences. But then, so long as they are in the larger interest of the nation and of the Nigerian people, so be it. Pursue it. Secure the nation. It is only when the nation is secured that we can be talking about governing. At, the, at this point, is the country secure? We are suffering severe insecurity. And that is an area that we need to work on. We have to tackle it. Because once we secure the nation, once we are secure, we'll be able to go, go a long way. And food in insecurity. So many other areas. Food insecurity. Primary. It's a huge problem. It is. So security is not just about the weapons. No, no, no. Not about the weapons, the sophistication of the weapons and all that and so forth. It begins basically from being able to feed, from being able to do what you want to do on a daily basis, and above all, from being sure that tomorrow will be. In other words, there is no fear whether you are going to see tomorrow or not. But once that is in doubt, then you are not secure. You, know, you, have to, you also have to think about it from the perspective of the coming generation. What type of life are they going to live? Are they going to be able to achieve the type of vision that you have for them? These are part of security issues. There are some short-term there's some middle term, there's some long term. But the stretch that connects them is what you do today. The policies that you put in place will determine whether you are safe today, whether you are secure today, to be able to lift it tomorrow and achieve those goals that you have in mind for tomorrow. In this book, you were worried about Africans braving the Mediterranean to leave. Mm. Why are you worried? I'm worried because it shows lack of faith in Africa, that people are giving up. I did say earlier on that we have in Africa what it would take to live a decent life, to live, uh, to be respectable, to make Africa the best continent in the world. God endowed us with whatever, human resources, material resources, and so forth. But when you now see people risking their lives, wanting to get out at all costs, then it means something is fundamentally wrong. And what is wrong is that the fear of today and the greater fear of tomorrow is driving some of these people out. And things have to be put back in place. Steps have to be taken. Policies have to be initiated and implemented to stop that. In this book, I want to read. You said colonialism came and Africa and Africans became raw materials for the white man. What does that mean? What it means is that it is not just that colonialism came to exploit our resources and take them away. They took our resources away quite all right. They also took us away. That is why you have so many people in the Caribbeans, in the Americans and different places who were originally, they, are, they, they came from Africa. They did not get there on their own volition, they were taken there as slaves. We were used, you know, we were part of the raw materials that they, they took away to use there to develop their country and so forth. Right now, there's a second slavery. And that second slavery, they call it Japa. Mm. It is serious. 
It is dangerous. Is it slavery? It is, because what some of our people go there to do is not what they would normally want to do. That's why we need to create an enabling environment for them to survive here, for them to live, to actualize their potentials. We are very resourceful as Africans. Nigerians are great people. They're great achievers wherever they go. So those who will go out should go because not only do they have value to add to those countries, they also stand to benefit. And then they go there and come back. And some of their own people should be able to come to our country. They used to come. The university used to be, you know, boast of expatriates here and there and so on. What they happened have to them? It takes UCH and some of these other people. People are coming from Saudi Arabia and some other countries to get treated at the UCH. University teaching hospital there. What has happened? The collapse of our system. The decay that we've been witnessing on all fronts, different fronts. So this is a goal that is still achievable. We could still achieve that goal in which instead of people rushing out, instead of people going out, people will be coming back and some other people too will be coming to this country. You, you, you said the process and pattern of decolonization in many parts of Africa did not make independent Africa less vulnerable to inducement and exploitation. The countries that got negotiated independence and those that went through armed struggle through the instrumentality and framework of liberation movements all shared a common post-colonial inheritance of political fragmentation, ever-increasing international competition, and multi-dimensional threats to national and regional security. Prof, when you talk about political fragmentation, is that the same thing as the political strategic environment you mentioned in the book? It is part of it. When you see uh, nations or countries been granted independence. I mentioned the path through which they got independence. Some of them conferences, Lancaster meetings and all that, and those who got it through on the on the, on the battlefield, who fought before they got it and so on. Thereafter, one will expect. Uh, for instance, when you are talking about Joshua uh, Nkomo, you know Mugabe or these other people, the, the, the division that came later on, mm. you know, ethnic-based and all that, the consequences lasted. You take some other countries, we also have the same thing. Or you talk about even our own country here in Nigeria. Uh, why is it that we have not been able to move forward, or at least further and deeper than we have? It's because... We, 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 we are so narrow-minded in the way some of our leaders have approached things. The type of coming together, the type of thoughts that ought to have wedded them together and think Nigerian. Ideology should have been the guiding uh, this thing. But people succumb to ethnic tendencies uh, they were thinking more. And it's even worse now than even immediate uh, post-independence era. You, you, you saw what happened in the last election? Oh, yes. You, you saw the ethnic division? I was, I was, I, I have never been that sad. It was very saddening because you now look forward to wonder what Nigeria will be some years from now. When Looking back at where we were coming from, I told some people, I said, look, there was a time when we had someone from Kano being a member of the House of Assembly here in New York State. There was a time when in Oshun State, Oshubu, 
someone from the northern part of the country defeated someone you would regard as a political juggernaut, Kolabalogi. And you see someone from the northern part being mayor in Enugu and all kinds of things. And people, you know, the, 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 that type of thing that we expected will have led to greater coming together of Nigerians and people identifying across boundaries. One was looking forward to a situation in which it would be possible for the ethnic divides, the lines, to get erased. And people will now treat others as brothers and sisters with no regard, no need to make reference to indigenship or no indigenship and so forth. But what do you get? A recourse to ethnic cocoons and, you know, shells. And uh, very worrisome when people will go and vote on the basis of, okay, this one is from my village. This one is not from my village. This one is my ethnic group. This one is not my ethnic group. I thought that policies should have been the driving. What ideologies were these people selling? The personalities of the individuals, their pedigree. What are they planning? What are they proposing? What are they putting on the table? To do for the Nigerian people, what is it that someone is going to do for your state? What am I going to do for Ogun state? What am I going to do for Enugu, Edo, and all that? Rather than this one is my, you know, my man, mm -hmm. my subethnic person. Very, very worrisome. It is a dangerous path to toad, and I hope we will recoil back from it and do the right thing. Development, progress, mean be able to liberate ourselves. Not just physical liberation from the but also mental liberation. You know, I was wondering, as our profs continue to write, you know, how long did it take you to write this book, Africa's Security Challenges in the 21st Century? Well, it is difficult to say precisely how long it took, because uh, while I was writing it, I was doing some other things. At the same time, there were some that were written, a, a few of the chapters were some ideas that, that threw up at some seminars and so on. And then the others, of course, were those that I wrote directly. Uh, it's difficult to say precisely how long it took, because at the time I was uh, putting this out, I was also putting out another book, you know, at the same time. So that it's really difficult to say precisely uh, how long it took. What inspires you to write? The environment. I believe that God has been so kind to me that uh, giving me the privilege of education and the Nigeria, putting me in Nigeria where all opportunities. So you have to give back mm. to the society, you have to give back to Nigeria, to Africa. We owe it a duty. And to those who are coming behind, the need to be fed with the right information. Uh, there are some books that deal with security generally and all that and so on, but most of them you see them dealing with European security, American security and some other. But in terms of Africa, there are quite, there are few, there are, there are few. And those of us with the privilege of education should be able to contribute our quota and guide those who are coming behind. And one would think that politics would have distracted you after you left the University of Ibadan, but you still keep on writing. Yes, yes, yes. I got into politics. Uh, my involvement in politics uh, was, I won't say I was drafted into politics. I went to politics because as a scholar, as an academic we were being paid even at the university for three, for three things. One is to teach, to lecture. The second is to conduct research. And the third is public service. In other words, we have to be involved, contribute to society. In the process of doing the third, of uh, contributing one's quota to community, I discovered that there was need to 
assist in putting people together. I was involved in some technical exercises, quite all right. Some states, or even the federal government, inviting you to serve on some technical committees. Through that, uh, some gaps I discovered, and I tried to encourage some people going to it. Once the right people, people know what needs to be done, are involved, we'll be able to get what we want. You cannot be criticizing and without getting in. And in the process of encouraging others to come in, they also drafted me. They also got me involved. They said, look, you two go and do something. Mm. And uh, I went in to be able to contribute my quota. And I thank God for the experience. And uh, I believe I, I tried my best. Who did you write this book for? It's for students generally in tertiary institutions and the general public, particularly those who are concerned and are interested in security. Security is not the exclusive preserve or concern of uh, diplomats, of international actors alone. Is it something that really should concern parents, the public in general, and of course, those who are to make decisions at different levels, those who make decisions at governmental levels, either it is international, it is regional, sub-regional, or national. It is for them. It is also for those who are even in the private sector. They need to know the environment in which they operate. If they do not know it, they will be finished before they know what is happening. So the private sector practitioners too also need to read the book. And of course, anybody that has anything to do with any other human being, they need to know what security is all about and how their own security is dependent upon the security of the other person. How their well-being could be determined or undermined by what the other people do. We are talking about the book, Africa's Security Challenges in the 21st Century, Power Principles and Praxis in Global Politics, a book written by Professor Tunde Adeniro, a former Minister of Education. Here is the book, and you can get it on udarabooks.com. The book has 12 chapters. Chapter 1 is entitled, The Global Context of African Security. I love that chapter. That chapter is historical. It tells you stories, in-depth conceptual and historical discussions on the drivers of insecurity in Africa. Chapter 2, another interesting chapter entitled Dynamic Factors of Regional Security. Chapter 3, Human Rights, Democracy, and African Security. A chapter I will recommend to you to read is Chapter 11, Food and African Security. We have mentioned it in this interview. It is a book that will open your mind to insecurity in Africa. The book profiles critical solutions to the lingering problems and the policy options to shape and secure Africa's future in the global arena. It is an incisive strategic analysis of the world's political outlook and Africa's security imperatives to bring about sustainable peace, meaningful democracy, justice, equitable development, and advantageous global presence in a world of unsettling scenarios. Prof, do Africans read enough? Our reading culture is not that impressive. I believe that... Uh, we need to do more to encourage Africans, Nigerians in particular, 
I have seen from experience that some parts of the of Africa, people read a lot. People read a lot. What part of Africa is that? East Africa, mm. yes, to some extent, Southern Africa, you know. But uh, in West Africa, Nigeria in particular, we don't seem to value books. We don't seem to appreciate what we stand to gain by reading books. Why is it so? What you read is what you are. Why it is so? Because of our values. Somehow in the past, when students, uh, when you see students, they go on vacation, they come back in the you know, secondary school and all that, they talk about, oh, I read this book, I read book. There was competition. They'd be talking about how many books they read, uh, they did book, and oh, if you haven't read some of those books, you feel uh, you've lost something and all that. Nowadays, uh, the culture of partying until this uh, situation now where there's uh, this recession, uh, the, the, the culture of partying and all that, and then, of course, the age of technology, people now... Uh, they stick to their phones and watching some of the things that do not really add much to their development. And so that, that is there. And so the both parents, guidance, mentors need to do more work. I believe that there are some channels, some avenues where reading culture is being promoted, particularly your organization. What you are doing, you are doing a tremendous job because you are promoting that reading culture. I know that there are some other, a few others that are also trying to do that. I think the more we have of that, the better for our society. But more importantly, I believe that the basic, the agencies, primary agencies that nurture uh, children and uh, so forth should take more interest in it. Uh, the Religious organizations, they should be encouraging more of this. And even in the schools, too, the schools should do much more than they are doing now. And uh, the, you cannot give what you don't have anyway. So I will recommend that even teachers in the various institutions should also be encouraged to read more and then encourage their students to read. And uh, those who mean well for the development of the country should also sponsor readers' clubs and uh, you know uh, book clubs all over the place because it is good for the country. It is good for the acquisition of knowledge and uh, information is power. You do not get this information unless, of course, you consult, you read books and you make yourself... Uh, available to new knowledge. What happens to a non-reading society? It's as good as dead. It's as good as dead because it will continue to decay. Uh, you people could be architects of their own destruction by not making themselves available to new information, to new knowledge. Things will be happening around you you will not know. Things that happened in the past that could repeat without having access to books and so forth, you will not know them. And things that may be about to happen, these are contained in works, in books, and other sorts of information. If you are not reading, you are dying. I thought they said readers are leaders. Are African leaders readers? Most of them are not readers and uh, it's a problem. Some of them are. Some of them are and you see the difference in the way they handle uh, governance and uh, that is why we need to encourage them the more. We need to make it uh, attractive to them so that they take it as part of what will enable them to succeed when you see those of them who read, you see the difference. The difference is clear. If they are not readers, will yes. they be philosopher kings? They can't be. They can't be if they are not philosophers. I mean, if they are not readers, because they are, the basis is not there. 
And if they are not philosopher kings, they will not be good leaders? Not necessarily. Uh, if they are philosopher kings, they are in better position to be more effective, to have more knowledge to work with. And knowledge, as I say, is power. They'll be able to get on better with governance than those who are not. As we round off this interview, I want you to look at the war in Ukraine. Look at the war in Gaza. What are the implications of these wars on insecurity in Africa? Serious implications, particularly because apart from the fact that the spillover effect in terms of uh, the economy and so is there, but the other areas that I would like us to look into is because the perception that Africans have of the, what is going on in those areas. You take about, uh, talk about Ukraine. Ukraine, in spite of what is going on there, uh, they are still able to send some grains to Sudan and all that to assist them. This is because they have access. But then, we should not forget that Ukraine is one of the leading exporters of grain to the rest of the world. But because of the war that is going on there, it is also affecting how much, how far they could go. And again, the weapons culture is having some impact because the fighting going on there is lined up countries on one side and the other. Some are lying behind Russia. Some are lying behind uh, Ukraine. It's not good for the world. You only need to get a little overboard and you start a third world war. So it is a dangerous trend and uh, that is why so much has to be done to encourage people to preach peace, to work on peace. You see India, you see China, you see some of these others, where they are, and you see the European uh, countries, I mean, of course, the uh, NATO people, we, 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 the position that they are taking. They are taking this for obvious reasons. And Africa has been deliberate. Africa has been careful, African countries, in terms of not wanting to be forced to one position the way uh, some other outside countries have been trying to get them, but rather the Western world. But then care has to be taken. It is not over yet. And Africa has to be watchful and be very careful. With regard to the one in the Gaza, it is unfortunate too that, uh, that that situation need not have been what it is. But then when Africans look at it, again, some see the war there from different perspectives that are wrong. We should see war as war, not good. Between human beings, these are brethren, these are brothers, these are cousins fighting themselves. We should work towards having a final peaceful solution to what is there. Some people who see it you know, along the religious lines and so on. By the way, the people who are there, you know, they are Semitic people. Then in terms of the religion that some people try to read into it, what's the percentage of Christians there? Mm. The percentage of Christians less than, you know, the, 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 the total population of Israel is just about 10 million. Now out of those, that 10 million, how many, what's the percentage of Christians? 1%, 2%? The uh, uh, Muslims or whatever, in Israel, maybe about 18% or so. Now, when you see a situation like that and see people are looking at it from a religious dimension, they are getting it wrong. But some people believe Judaism can also be Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Well, if you see the Judaism as Christianity, it depends on how you interpret it. Okay. Do they see Jesus coming back? So uh, there are all kinds of uh, this. Mm. What I believe we should look at is from the human angle, we do not want war. In that place, 
look at the, 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 uh, the armed forces, over 500 and something thousand in the Israeli army. What's the percentage of Christians there? Negligible. The percentage of, uh, you know, uh, the Muslims. The, or the, so the, the way they are there, the way they put them together, and then, of course, from the, you know, Gaza you know, mm. area, you ask yourself, what prompted, you know, that type of attack that precipitated this? Israel the, has virtually destroyed Gaza. Virtually. And then you look at the, you look at the situation. I wrote a book, monograph, which I termed, uh, the title is Wars Without End. What is happening? both in Ukraine and Gaza, confirm my predictions. There will continue to be war so long as there is no justice, fairness, equity, and so on. You cannot say the Muslims or the Palestinians or this thing and so forth are right or wrong. You cannot say the Israelis are right or wrong. You have to look at the various issues, take them one by one, and know that it has to be a question of give and take. And before you can find a final solution to this, you will have to get them to agree to certain fundamental issues. In other words, that humanity is one. The fact that you are an Arab or you are Muslim, you are this thing, is not of your own making. You did not create yourself. Mm. If you are Christian or you are Jew, you are whatever you are, it's not of your own making. So you find yourself on the on earth, common earth, belonging to all of us, and then you have to live together. If you feel that some other people have to be wiped out of the face of the world, or reduced to specific countries, you feel that some people have to be wired up from some place and so forth, you are getting it wrong. Because you did not create these people. God created everybody. And we have to find accommodation. And this accommodation can be found through negotiations, dialogue, discussions. We shouldn't be tired until we find permanent solutions. But the conqueror race, if we have uh, feeling that, oh no, you've been destined to be the only one, of course, there'll be a problem. You have to give room for accommodation. Professor Tunde Adenio, thank you for featuring on State Affairs. You're most welcome. Professor Adenio earned a doctorate in political science, specializing in international relations and strategic studies. And you will find his scholarly ideas, ideas, his theories in this book entitled Africa's Security Challenges in the 21st Century, Power, Principles and Praxis in Global Politics. I recommend this book to you. You can get it by contacting us on Udara Book WhatsApp numbers. And you can also get it on udarabooks.com. On udarabooks.com. It's a super book. You need to read it. Professor Tunde Adeniro is a former Minister of Education in Nigeria. A former ambassador to Germany. Until I come your way again, I am Edmund Opilo. Thank you for watching. Stay cool.